Hi, welcome to Total Sound. My name is Ron Curtis. I'm Dory Diamond. Who's our guest tonight, Dory? Tonight we have Bill Bruford with Bill Bruford's Earthworks. That's right. Total Sound is an alternative music program which showcases music and musicians that don't always get the spotlight. We have a great interview with Bill, plus some live music and some other interesting surprises. So uh, here it is for you. Total Sound. That's right. Our guest tonight, we are today or whenever this is shown, is Mr. Bill Bruford, drummer, composer, and all around good fellow. Bon vivant. Bon vivant from Earthworks, currently touring the United States with Bill Bruford's Hello Earthworks. and welcome to room 302. That's right. We're in uh, the... Welcome uh, to the big time. Isn't it lovely? We're in the Palos Verdes Inn here. And, uh, Bill, uh, we have many questions. You I have, can see they're all written down you there. Have, <laughs> I'm ready. You have many answers. And yep. uh, we were with you today at KCRW. Mm -hmm. And you were doing an interview and you were mentioning that KCRW is one of the stations that gives your music a chance and mm -hmm. plays it. Mm -hmm. With all the tight radio playlists and everything that's going on, what is it that you feel can be done in order to enlarge your audience, in order to give the radio stations a kick in the butt to play some more of your music? Oh, well, I mean, I'm, you know, I'm really not on a crusade here. It's, it's the way the American scene is set up right now. Something might change. Usually an oil crisis or two has a big effect. The last time the last time there was a big change was really in 73 when the Arabs, you know, whacked up the price of oil and, and oh, vinyl. For the vinyl, sure. Vinyl, vinyl went cost. through the roof. Now Record we're suddenly right. doubled in price, whatever it was. Now we have CDs, though. And, uh... Yeah, you do. So I don't quite know what happens next. But there's no doubt it's a difficult time for, um, what should we say, music with funny bits in it. Music with funny bits? Is that yeah, how you yeah, know? Or music that does anything that deviates at all from from the norm, the norm being, let's say, for the point of argument, the Fleetwood Mac LP. So, it, so intelligent music as opposed to bland... No, I didn't say of. that. You said that. Well, but I, that's what I, I think. I that There's, this is called the intelligence of jazz. I believe that. <laughs> well, there we go. No, there is, you know, there is a, a, a sort of norm of pop music, and, right. that, and that is, you know, in the interests of companies to, um, to keep that going around. Uh, and that, that sort of spoils the market for the rest of us. In other words, every time Genesis makes two or three million Mm. Or, or spends two or three million making an LP, that's a lot of money that other guys could also use to make LPs with stranger music. <laughs>
the sound of earthworks is it is an attractive sound it is designed to be attractive as opposed to repellent right I mean there are groups that will repel you deliberately so you know Archie Shep in his heyday or King Crimson when it was really going you know they can be repellent orally just, yeah. just up here in, in the ears um, earthworks is not like that at all it's it's inviting you into it most of the lead sounds are warm brass or wooden right most of the drum sounds are fairly delicate um, although we can get noisy, but it's an inviting kind of thing, an airy, inviting sound, which is deliberately constructed. You made a really interesting comment we were uh, in the car earlier. You were saying that uh, with all the bands and all the projects and things you've done, you tend to outgrow groups. Um, you just tend to outgrow a situation. I mean, you look at the Rolling Stones or look at the mm -hmm. Kinks or, you know, the Who keeps coming back. You know, they break up, they come back, mm -hmm. and this and this. But you were very honest in saying that, you know, you get to the point where you outgrow a situation, you don't feel the need to go back to it, as you mentioned with yeah. Patrick Moraz. Yeah, know? that's generally the case. Yeah, you put something together as a vehicle for your ideas at that time. And if it doesn't apply yeah. anymore? It's well, yeah, pretty much. That's it. And you work through that series of ideas, let's say, with... Um, with my own band, I was very keen on writing, very keen on the clang. This is the Bruford band with right. Alan Holdsworth and Jeff Boleyn. Very keen on the clanging sound of brilliant Roger Toms. Right. Very keen on using Alan, who introducing him to America as well. Uh, very keen on odd meters. It's very much an odd meter group that was mm -hmm. as a way of playing the drums. And you work through that, and then you know you go on to another thing. And after a while, you think, well, maybe this whole combination of horns and keyboards and upright bass would be an interesting way to go. And you do that. And people grow naturally through these things, as musicians do. We're going to do the bass. Hi, we're here with Django Bates from Earthworks. Hello, Hi. nice to see you. Um, we're going to be doing what we just did with Bill. We're going to have some information about some of his keyboards. He's keyboard player and horn player for Earthworks. This is the most interesting looking horn. It looks like an, an antique. Yeah, I should start with this. It's the simplest out of all this stuff. What do we call this? Well, in England it seems to be called tenor horn, and out here I've heard it called alto horn and some guy described it as a peck call and he huh. told me it's because in the brass bands it just goes peck, 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 peck and just plays the offbeats all the time so that's a good name for it. So this is an actual piece of equipment that is never hooked up to any electronics and we kind of use it as... as Not yet. I suppose I could get around to that but it would just mean it would get complicated like everything else. Is it actually an antique? I mean is this considerably no, it just, old? it just looks very old. The lacquer's come off it for some reason and I think I should leave it like this. It sounds quite good without it. It looks wonderful. Yeah. Of course, you don't want to alter it by... I don't want to take any risks. Yeah, I, don't, I don't blame you. Yeah. Perhaps you could blow a few notes yeah. on it. And, uh, and it's in E-flat, and it's sort of somewhere go. in between flugel and euphonium, whatever. It's got a good range on it as well. It goes from... Uh, 
later on tonight it'll go a lot higher when I'm warmed up. Almost like a mixture between a tuba and a flugelhorn, uh, sort yeah, of. Yeah, yeah, you know? somewhere in there. It's, it's pretty sort amazing. Of brass bands of England. Music. This is primarily the horn that you would play in Earthworks, or definitely, yeah. I started on trumpet, but I just found it very hard to get any individual sound out of a trumpet. And certainly, I've never seen any musicians playing this before, so you're probably all by yourself. Good, as far as this. no, no good. competition. No, absolutely. Yeah. And uh, as far as the keyboards go, we having your basic uh, synthesizer setup and sampler over here. Do you ever take any, uh, for example, any of the sounds from any other horns and things and incorporate them into the keyboard banks that we have? Um, I've got one sampler, and that's uh, I've used, that's the Ensonic. And I have sampled not horns so much. I've sampled me hitting a bell and singing a note, which came out quite nicely. That was quite useful. That's, that's yeah. wonderful. Um, kids in England that are getting involved in jazz now, um, a lot of this equipment, a lot of the equipment that Earthworks uses is expensive. It's not, not the type of equipment that is as easy to get as a trumpet or a saxophone or an acoustic bass or what, whatever. And Earthworks really seems to be alone in being able to incorporate electronics into what is essentially jazz. Mm. Do you feel that um, if the kids did have more access, money-wise or whatever, to this type of equipment, that the state of British jazz would lean a little more towards electronics, or do you think that they would uh, stay away from it and want to stay more traditional? I think it's not so much to do with gear as just to do with what they listen to and what they want to reproduce or what they want to get away from, depending on the way they feel about music, whether they want to recreate something or, or get something new. I mean, I. I got into this by accident. Uh, someone kept on nagging me to get the synthesizer because I was just playing Fender Rhodes right. on this gig. And I accidentally got this, which is like everyone who saw it said, that's a mistake, man. Those are going out of fashion. And of course, three years later, everyone wants one. This is the Prophet 5. Right. And uh, this, I don't know, you can get these for about £400, um, $800 now. And it's not really a hell of a lot of money. Would you say that the that the kids, the jazz purists, would really want to stay away from electronics because it would remind them too much of the fusion bands that they feel might be a little excessive in their yeah, soloing? Yeah, I think a lot things? of them all maybe wouldn't even know what to do with it instinctively because none of the sounds would suggest anything to them, whereas they can sit down at a piano and that's going to suggest right. Herbie Hancock or whatever. You know. We wanted to talk a little about your other current project. Mm -hmm. uh, Anderson, Bruford, Wakeman, and Howe. I understand there's a second album? That's yeah, we finished a second album. Yeah, that's a sort of uh, an epic in itself. That's been running for a, for a while. That started around March or April. How is it that you guys came together? I mean, there's, there's press about the fighting, about the Oh, the John band. came around. John came around and said, you know, what's this about an SDX, which is the instrument I play? And I said, well, come on, I'll show you what it does, you know, and he really liked that. I mean, he thought it was great. Typical John Anderson. Absolutely loved the SDX. Could yeah. do a million things at once, you know. Could right. sound like Aboriginal heat. Right. Could sound like Ayers Rock at 110 degrees, you know. There you go. And uh, so he said, that's nice. And I, th I thought at the end of that conversation, I was going to play on one of his solo records. But things uh, change, you know. And by the time Steve Howe turned up and Rick Waitman and we made this LP, then people are saying, well, the best way to promote this is to go on tour. Do you want to come on tour? And usually you'll find musicians say yes rather than no. It's, it's in their system. It's, it's just you know, in your blood, if, right? If people ask you, you say yes. It's what actors and musicians do, generally speaking. You, it's tough to say no. There wasn't any animosity or anything within no. the band after, or let's say a, a sense of not being together after all this time. Oh, I, you know, I don't know. I don't can don't can, can we do it again? You know, I'm, I'm not going to go out and collect Rick Wakeman. <laughs> <piece>. I mean, <laughs> you know, it's not my style. But I mean, he I says take, he has 24 solo albums. I was. I take I take a guy as I find him. You know, uh, if he's there at the session and he can play the music and he can stand up straight and he sounds good, which Rick does and can do all those three things. Um, then that's fine. As opposed to other members work. that we were talking you know, about. I'm trying, to, I'm trying to downgrade this stuff. You see, you guys think about this stuff a lot. We don't think about this. You think about that, your music. You want to play your music and make yeah, music. Yeah, I'm saying that, who's playing that keyboards. That blows me away. I mean, on the, on the way it. to the studio, I say, I wonder who's playing keyboards on this to myself. I think maybe it's Rick. Walk in, there's Rick. Hello, Rick. How are you? Boom, 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 boom. Hi. 
We're here at the Strand with Bill Bruford, who is graciously going to be telling us a little bit about his wonderful Simmons electronic drum kit, etc. Bill? Or not so wonderful, it's depending not? whether you play it or not. Well, <laughs> I wouldn't know the first thing about this. Well, it's, give us it's kind, of the, kind of the heart of the band, really. A, a number of pads and the idea of being, of course, a drummer's fantasy that generally any pad can be any sound. So there are basic drums. But all that stuff can change fairly easily if I select another patch over here. All this equipment shifts and then it turns into pitches, which can then be sustained. You're a virtual octave. orchestra here. I'm an octave. I'm an old orchestra. You're a virtual orchestra. Uh, chords plus drums. Oops. Kicks. Correct. And, and these patches can be shifted via a little foot pedal here, which allows me to shift through them. So we have, then we could have, or we could have, or we could have. The drum set can be anything that you want it to be at any time, depending on what the composition calls for. This is really amazing. When you say uh, zone intelligent, is that sort of phrasing uh, itself as being such an intelligent uh, piece of work? Uh, yeah, I mean, this, this reads information across the pad, uh -huh. as well as under velocity. The harder you hit it, different things happen. <laughs> you're back over here uh, doing something like this as I move across of course there's different pitches from the conga drum depending on where you play depending on where you move around on the pad and how hard you hit it right. any information you've stored comes up on this TV screen. I've got TV here. Unbelievable. So I can watch the game. Things get a little tedious. The in World the music. Series is on. That's right. World Series. That's right. You know, it is amazing to me now the drummer as composer. Uh, well, drummers have always written. Actually, they always composed. But it's just that a, an instrument like this can give you uh, a variety of nice ideas. Um, such as the kind of thing I've been demonstrating. You know, you can of course store it all. Um, it's in instantly recallable. Um, and the idea is that basically the audience should never care about any of this stuff at all. It's, it's, uh, this is part of my equipment and it should be easy for me to operate and not in any way intrude in what you're delivering to the crowd. Now of course you have all the electronic equipment here, but do the, does the snare drum and the cymbals basically remain the core of the drum kit? Mm. As far as keeping their original sound, is, do you actually do anything with the uh, cymbals and the, the yeah, snare Yeah, of drum? course. Play, apart from playing them, they are cymbals and snare drum. That's, right, that's but all there, there isn't anything that you would use in order to modify their sound the same way as you would with the sound. No, sometimes the pads turn into cymbals too. But generally, these these are the kind of sounds that I particularly want. Right. Uh, so I'm happy to keep these live real metals and the real snare um, as part of the heart of the matter. And there is, of course, all this electronic stuff as well. One more question before we go. When you are composing an idea, do you compose them actually on the drums? Do you have a, do you play keyboards per se to be able to put together the melody lines that you use? Yeah, I'm kind of a frustrated keyboard player as well. So this is, as it were, a, a half and half. It's a hybrid drum set and keyboard set so that I can play certain keyboard figures from here. I mean, I could play, um, I could play this part on the uh, on the keyboard, but it wouldn't sound the same. The notes are actually just coming from the keyboard. have a keyboard player play this but it's not going to sound the same it's, it's the rolling feel of the drums that you're after so right. I'm trying hard not to duplicate something that Django Bates might want to do over there I don't want to tread on his toes we're looking for complementary parts <laughs> Thank you. 
fortunate enough to perform at a fairly high standard with some of these guys, and um, I don't think I'm going to go and join a, a, a bar band. <laughs> in a hurry. You know, it's 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 too important to me. You know, I'd rather not play at all yeah. than play some yeah. junk. Really. Any chance of another solo album, or do you think that all your energies and earthworks are kind of satisfying well, that? I, I I hope I have something called Bill Bruford's Earthworks for a long time. Whether it is this particular configuration of musicians. I wouldn't know, but uh, let's hope that we have a Bill Bruford's Earthworks that would be a vehicle for my suitably rabid and manic ideas for, uh, for a so while. I certainly do hope so. So, so perhaps a situation, wonderful music. situation like King Crimson, maybe, you have one person that's basically involved with the direction think, of the band. Yeah, I think we have Bill Bruford's Earthworks, yeah, that I would use or not use as a sort of fit. And we, uh, we look forward to having you with us uh, next time you're here. and. Uh, we're very glad that you could be here with us tonight, and we look forward to uh, the show that we're going to be seeing and uh, everything else. And That's very kind. Thanks. Thank you, sir. Thanks thank you. for your questions. Thank for you. Ron and Dory, this is uh, Total Sound, and we'd like to thank you for being with us, and tune in next time for more. Good night. Thank you.